Hello, my name is Andrew Taylor Peck. I am the senior pastor at Trinity United Church of Christ in Canton, Ohio. Today's sermon is entitled, The Better Part. It is based on the scripture from the gospel according to Luke, chapter 10, verses 38 to 42. Here is a scripture reading. Now, as they went on their way, he entered a certain village where a woman named Martha welcomed him into their home. She had a sister named Mary, who sat at the Lord's feet and listened to what he was saying. But Martha, Martha was distracted by her many tasks. So she came to him and asked, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to do all the work by myself? Tell her then to help me. But the Lord answered her, Martha, Martha, you are worried and distracted by many things. There is need of only one thing. Mary has chosen the better part, which will not be taken from her. There they were, riding through the west on horseback, the grizzled old cowboy and the middle-aged suburbanite, Billy Crystal and Jack Palance in the movie City Slickers, riding across the beautiful landscapes of the west. This was one of my favorite movies of all time. You might remember the movie. It was about three men old friends from way back who would spend a couple weeks every summer getting out of their suburban lifestyles and going out and doing something daring that was supposed to change their lives, give them a new perspective and new wisdom about the world. In contrast to the button-down suburban lifestyle they lived, they went out and did something exotic each year. This movie featured their decision to spend their vacation together going on a cattle drive helping a bunch of seasoned cowboys move a herd of cattle across the big plains of the West with the hope that, in the process, they might get in touch with their more primitive selves, might find something useful about the meaning of life. Jack Palance won an Oscar for his portrayal of the boss of the cattle drive, a leathery old cowboy named Curly. Curly lives up to all of our stereotypes about cowboys. He's mean and he's tough, and he can do anything with a rope or a whip or a knife. But in his rough and rugged way, he's also very wise. As they ride along, Palance and Crystal's conversation turns philosophical. Against the backdrop of an open sky and jagged mountain peaks, clear streams and beautiful scenery, Billy Crystal turns to Curly and asks with longing, your life makes so much sense to you, he says, to which Curly replies, you city folk, you worry a lot. How old are you, 38? 39, Billy Crystal replied. You all come up here about the same age, responded Curly. You spend 50 weeks getting knots tied up in your ropes, and you think two weeks up here will help untie them for you. None of you get it. He pauses a minute, and then he goes on. You know what the secret to life is? No, what? asked Crystal. And then Curly says, one thing. Just one thing. You stick to that, and everything else don't mean nothing. That's great, says Crystal. But what's the one thing? Curly looks at him for a minute, and then he says, well, that's what you have to figure out. Now, when I first saw this movie as a teenager, 39 seemed so old. So I looked at Billy Crystal and saw his receding hairline and growing waistline, and I thought, that will never be me. He looks so terrible, so old. As my 38th birthday is just a few weeks away, suddenly Billy Crystal in City Slickers does not seem so old at all. As my hairline has receded and my waistline has expanded, suddenly Billy Crystal in City Slickers looks pretty darn good. Now I think Curly, the character, was taking a page out of today's scripture of Martha and Mary in his response to Billy Crystal. He points, like Jesus, to the fact that many of us need to stop being so worried and distracted in our busy lives. We need to focus on just one thing. And as Christians, this one thing is our relationship to God through Christ. There are a few lessons that we can learn from this well-known scripture of Martha and Mary. The first lesson is that this passage, I believe, is a both-and story, not an either-or story. We need to both be contemplative by sitting at the feet of Christ, and active by doing good works 
by being the hands and feet of Christ in the world. This story is immediately preceded by the parable of the Good Samaritan, which ends with the words, Go and do likewise. We are not told in this 10th chapter of the Gospel of Luke to only go or do. We are told to go and do, as well as sit and listen. Many of us are quite familiar with the story, and it has long been argued as a call from Jesus away from actions and toward a contemplative spiritual practice. Preachers and scholars alike have argued this scripture as an either-or rebuke of Martha and praise of Mary. In our either-or black-and-white world, we tend to believe that for someone to be right, someone else must be wrong. Lots of sermons have been preached that make a very serious division between service and study and say that service without study is empty. But what about study without service? What if this story isn't about elevating one over the other? What if it's not about Jesus saying to Martha, we don't need physical nourishment, we only need spiritual nourishment? What if it is about Jesus instead saying to Martha, you have become burdened by the elaborate nature of the meal you are preparing for me. An elaborate meal is not as important as listening to me. Prepare a simpler meal so that you have time to sit and listen to my teaching. This text isn't about siding with Martha or Mary. It's about living into the kingdom of God that is already, but not yet. Through the integration of prayer and study and service and action. The second lesson that we can learn from today's scripture is the fact that Mary was making a bold statement by sitting at the feet of Christ as a woman. While it may not seem like a big deal to us today, Mary was taking the position that was reserved only for male disciples when she sat at the feet of Christ. And her doing so was actually a violation of both cultural and religious norms and practices and rules of her day. This is just one of the many examples that we see in the Gospels, where Jesus' message and ministry was given to all who would follow him, regardless of race and gender, regardless of their standing in their society. Jesus' message came to everyone. And Mary takes the traditional role of a male disciple when she sits at Jesus' feet. We cannot fail to notice this important detail in today's story, even though it does not make sense in our world, but in Jesus' world, it was significant. The third lesson that we can get from today's scripture is that Jesus was upset with Martha because she was distracted and worried not because she was showing him hospitality by making him a meal. It was not that she was doing the wrong thing, but that she was doing the right thing, showing Jesus hospitality in the wrong way, by letting it overwhelm her and distract her. The fourth lesson that we can learn from today's scripture is that we as a church need to be God-centered and God-focused in all that we do, sitting at the feet of Christ like Mary. We need to be prayerful. We need to take time to contemplate, to meditate, and read scripture together as a church, and not just rush around planning and programming activity. If we do so, if we just rush around all the times with a busy social calendar, we will end up with a church full of people who are burnt out and bitter, but spiritually empty and dry. Losing sight of Jesus, who is our purpose. Losing sight of Jesus, who is our center to begin with. We might make decisions at a meeting without praying for each other as a group. Without sitting down and getting to know each other's stories, each other's hearts, each other's joys and concerns. We might prepare a beautiful meal in our fellowship hall, but forget to give thanks to Christ in the breaking of the bread. And this is exactly what happened to Martha understandably. She was so wrapped up in her preparation for Jesus that she missed the most important thing, that he was sitting right there in her house, ready to share the good news and bless her. Getting ready for him, she missed him entirely. When we host guests, how often are we just like Martha? In ancient Israel, during Jesus' day, hospitality was extremely important. Offering a meal and quenching water 
to everyone who walked through your door might be a matter of life and death in the harsh climate. Yet, even though hospitality is not a matter of life and death in our world, it is still important today. Hosting social gatherings is one activity that my wife Sarah and I greatly enjoy. However, I have caught myself after the last dish has been cleaned up, not having had any meaningful conversations with the guests the whole time they were there, not knowing anyone better or having any come any closer to God through my interactions with the people in my house. I realized at the end of the night sometimes that I had spent the past five hours running around, shopping, preparing, cleaning the house, serving the guests, cleaning up afterwards, and ending the night completely exhausted and, to be honest, a bit cranky and frustrated. Yet I had not actually engaged Christ at the gathering. I had missed the point with all of my busyness and distraction. The story of Martha and Mary is a good reminder to take time for that deep conversation, to take time to be vulnerable with each other and learn each other's hearts. It can remind us how to be in community as Christians together. And that, I think, may get us close to the real heart of this Martha and Mary story. There was nothing wrong in and of itself with Martha's fixing the food. This is the way people show love and welcome and hospitality and care. There is nothing wrong. In fact, there is something absolutely essential about showing one's love of God and neighbor by doing the mundane tasks of preparing and serving. Martha, preparing that meal of hospitality is doing a good thing, a necessary thing, an act of service. But if we try to do this kind of service apart from the life-giving word of the gospel, apart from the vision that comes only from God, it will distract us, and finally, it will wear us down. Jesus, the living word, is present right there in her house. And if she is going to show God love and love of neighbor, if she is going to show hospitality to the stranger and care for the lost, then everything depends on whether or not she is willing to sit down at the feet of Christ and listen first. Recently, I heard a story about a youth minister taking a group of students on a mission trip to Jamaica. On their trip, they visited a missionary who was teaching at a local elementary school. And they spent some time observing her in the classroom. Now this classroom, you can imagine, it was overcrowded with children, most of them desperately poor, all of them needy and wiggly and noisy and squirmy. It was a difficult and chaotic learning environment. But the youth group marveled to see that the teacher carried herself with great calm and patience, treating all of the children with love and respect, despite the poverty and the chaos. They decided that the only way she could possibly be doing this day after day was that she loved teaching so much. But they were surprised when they asked her to hear her say, oh, I don't come here every day because I love teaching. I come here every day because I love Jesus, and I see the face of Jesus in every single one of the little children that I teach. I think that the teacher had been like Mary, sitting at Jesus' feet first before taking her actions. And because she had, she could get up like Martha and teach those children with joy and hope seeing Jesus in the face of every single one of them. Maybe, just maybe, it was as if she had been sitting on horseback riding under the jagged Rocky Mountains on the beautiful plains of the West, listening to Curly telling her, there is just one thing. Teaching us all here in Canton not to be so busy and distracted in our lives, but to focus on one thing, our relationship to God through Christ. Let's conclude this sermon with a prayer. You have taught us, O God, that the way to life is to love you with all our heart and to love our neighbor as ourselves. But we are often so overwhelmed by the swirling demands of life that we cannot truly do either. But then, in your mercy, there is Jesus. Come to visit in our home. Come to speak to us in the midst of our chaotic life. Let us, like Mary, sit at his feet and listen to his word 
his word that gives life. Then, having heard that word, let us, like Martha, get up to serve others in Jesus' name. Amen.